Commutation readings are made possible thanks to viewers like you. Please visit us at commutationconstruct.locals.com. Memberships are free to start with coupon code CCFREE. Hello and welcome to Commutation Readings. Today we're going to cover Anti-Federalist Paper Number 2. Uh, I'm James Darian, happy to have you all here. If you all want to help me with the YouTube algorithm or BitChute algorithm or whatever and leave, leave a like or a like or, and subscribe, I'd appreciate it. If you want to wait till later, feel free and don't forget you can also give that one. So, um, today we are going to cover... Bam. Anti-Federalist paper number two. We have been told of phantoms. Uh, I did read some of this a while ago. It, it has been a long time. So excuse me if I'm uh, if I do recognize some of the lines, but I, this is pretty much um, this is a first in-depth reading at the very least. I, I didn't super uh go into it the first time so i'm really looking forward to this i hope you guys like it um excuse me um i've got a bit of a sore throat and my braces have been chafing a lot lately so uh especially because i'm doing two podcasts today but uh bear with me as we go through this and yeah let's just uh jump on into it so Anti-Federalist Paper Number 2, We Have Been Told of Phantoms. The adoption of this government will not ameliorate our own particular system. I beg leave to consider the circumstances of the Union antecedent to the meeting of the Convention at Philadelphia. We have been told of phantoms and ideal dangers to lead us into measures which will, in my opinion, be the ruin of our country. If the existence of those dangers cannot be proved, if there be no apprehension of wars, if there be no rumors of wars, it will place the subject in a different light, and plainly evince to, to the world that there cannot be any reason for adopting measures which we apprehend to be ruinous and destructive. When this state, Virginia, proposed that the general government should be improved, Massachusetts was just recovered from a rebellion which had brought the republic to the brink of destruction from a rebellion which was crushed by by that federal government which is now so much cont co yeah, contemned and abhorred. So, uh, I did start uh, this recording before and I realized hold on I want to check which rebellion this was so I paused uh, at the, pretty much at this point to read what the rebellion is this is referring to Sh to Shay's rebellion um, I apologize for not being a master of uh, of his US historical rebellions uh, so essentially uh, back during this time, Shea, uh, there was a rebellion going on in Massachusetts. Shea is basically just a guy who was named after, uh, deemed the leader, but uh, at least according to History Channel, he was just one of many guys who was former military, rebelling against the state for uh, supplying, tax, doing taxes that were apparently well beyond what Britain was doing to them before the revolution, and it was driving all the farmers bankrupt, essentially. Um so that so that's kind of what the rebellion was about, and the people wanted their due. They felt like the government was just kind of enriching themselves off of it. Um, and what you had after that was essentially a bit of a there was propaganda going both ways that the um, uh, that the government needed to be more powerful in order to handle rebellions, which. Uh, in this case, uh, the author is pointing out that we just took care of a rebellion. It wasn't a problem. A everyone's freaking out about how our, this government's so terrible, but it literally just handled the rebellion and pushed it down. Uh, that's kind of what I'm getting from this, um, because a lot of the issues with the Constitution was that they, they wanted to make a more powerful central government because they felt like the Articles of Confederation weren't enough. Um, 
if, during the convention. So it, it this is an interesting argument because now that, having just looked at the uh, a bit of Shay's Rebellion, because uh, believe it or not, I didn't learn about Shay's Rebellion in school. My my uh, education did not was very passive about American history. Didn't talk about really anything that would be deemed negative. Except I grew up in the South, so it was a lot more favorable to the uh, economic aspect of the uh, of the secession versus the um, versus the North, which. Uh, I I'm not going to really get into the politics of that, but there there I guess the one thing I will say about that is it is somewhat fair to say that if if farmers had spent their entire life savings to get a slave and then the slaves were being freed without them getting any kind of without the slave or the farmer getting any kind of remuneration that's kind of an issue. Because you're basically bankrupting everyone now. <laughs> like, the slave is free. Okay, he has no home, he has no money. Uh, the farmer has no slaves. Well, he just spent his fortune on the slaves. So, they're all kind of screwed. Um, to an extent. That's, uh... That was kind of uh, my upbringing. That was, that, that's somewhere along the lines of what I was taught as far as, like rebellions go <laughs> uh, th that's basically the the peak of it uh, that and uh, the boston tea party and that was all in elementary school i pretty much didn't get any uh relevant like revolutionary history uh ever since then i think i think i took a u.s history course in high school and honestly i don't even remember what it covered it, it, it was kind of a bullshit class <laughs> um even though it was an AP class. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. L looking at this, though, it's... It's interesting to see that... Th th so, on one side, the Federalists were wanting to have the power to squash any rebellion, and the Anti-Federalists are just like, what are you talking about? You just did. <laughs> th that seems to be the uh, argument about this, and... It it ended up creating it end it seems like it created a sort of an air of propaganda where anyone who was against the Constitution was deemed a rebel um, in the image of Shea, who himself was kind of glorified as a rebel, uh, though he was I, I will note he was later pardoned. Uh, a lot of the people who rebelled were pardoned, except for a couple who did other crimes like burglary. Um, it's and it, it actually started out as peaceful. Remember, we had no Bill of Rights at this time. The, originally, the rebellion was just a peaceful protest, and then militaries were brought out against them. Uh, so, it's incredibly interesting to see the politics of an era of the United States where there was no Bill of Rights. It's incredibly fascinating and th this has motivated me to just look way way more into it so get get getting refocused into this um we can see told of phantoms and ideal and ideal dangers to lead us to measures which will in my op opinion be the ruin of the country uh, essentially he thinks that we're going to abandon freedoms and we're going to we are going to lose the liberty that was the driving force of us by making the federal government more powerful. That is what I get from this now. Um, there will be no... If the, uh, if the existence of those dangers cannot be proved, if there be no apprehension of wars, if there be no rumors of wars, it will place the subject in a different light. So, if you can't prove it, if you can't show that... We have wars. If you can't show that there's apprehension for this new government to go to war, um, I, I, I may have just slipped, uh, slipped that up, actually. If there be no apprehension of wars, if there be no rumors of wars. Um, like So 
if people aren't freaked out about coming wars and coming insurrections, then they're going to feel differently about reorganizing the entire government to give it more power to quash rebellions. <laughs> that that seems to be um, part of the what this whole argument is about. Um, so yeah, uh, Virginia proposed that the general government should be approved. They're just like, hey, Massachusetts was just recovering from a rebellion, which had brought the republic to the brink of destruction. From a rebellion, which had brought the republic to the brink of destruction from a rebellion, which was crushed by that federal government, which is now so... That's awkward. That's a very awkward now that I'm rereading it. Because he uses... He uses rebellion twice so freak, so quickly. Uh, it's, it's a little awkwardly phrased but and the problem is even reading this i can't tell and even having read about shay's rebellion was it the rebellion itself that uh brought that brought nearly brought the republic to the brink of destruction the brink of destruction yeah brink of destruction <laughs> i told you guys I'm, I'm i'm having trouble talking today uh was it the rebellions themselves that brought people the republic near the brink of destruction destruction or was it the federal government's response? Because it's saying the federal crushed by that federal government, which is now so much uh, condemned and abhorred. So was it the crushing that the federal government did? Is it just that people are... I, from what I'm getting, it sounds like he's saying the people are condemned and abhorred by the Articles of Confederation government. The uh, initial uh, form of government of the United States. People are abhorred by it. Uh, but I. Mass it's very, very oddly written. So is, is Massachusetts. Was, what was the, the, the destruction they're talking about? Anyhow, if anyone has more context on this or has any idea, please. Comment below. I I'm very curious about this. Um, and I hope you are too. <laughs> a vote of that august body for 1,500 men, aided by the exertions of the state, silenced all opposition and shortly restored the public tranquility. So the rebellion got very easily quashed, essentially. There we go. Hopefully that'll help. Massachusetts was satisfied that these internal commotions were so happily settled happily and somewhat bl bloodily settled <laughs> um and was unwilling to risk any similar distress by theoretical exp theoretic experiments again e e e i thought looking up the details of shay's rebellion uh, even just a glimpse of it would help me understand this but i i'm still unsure what he means by the distress by theoretic experiments that's a very what's the word that's that that's a very well it's an odd line but i i, I don't really have the right word for it right now but it's a very vague statement at the very least without the proper context of living in this time it it's hard to say and i'm not even sure if living in that time would be enough context but it's hard to say in what way he's referring uh like is massachusetts unwilling to change their government to out of their fear of more potential, uh, more potential rebellions, are are they are they scared of taking actions because of the risk of rebellions? What's kind of the case here? That that's it, it's funny because the Federalist Papers have so much framing, and yet this almost seems like it's missing framing. <laughs> It's like they've they've got a lot of the picture, but they're skipping over parts that they're just like, oh, people know about those. Uh, that's kind of what I'm getting 
thus far. I mean, I I, I went to uh, another source uh, over here, History Channel, uh, his, History Channel's cover of Shay's Rebellion, um, and I, I might go over this quote a little bit with you guys later, but but it's it's weird to me that it's kind of it has this vaguity to it and maybe it wasn't vague in the time this might just be a change in language but that's kind of where i'm at and again if anyone has any comment or any kind of um, greater familiarity with what this kind what this uh specific uh paragraph is about and what the context he's referring to means I would love to hear your take on it. I am. I, it's hard for me to have a take because it reads oddly to me. Were the Eastern states willing to enter into this measure? Were they willing to accede to the proposal of Virginia? In what manner was it received? Connecticut revolted at the idea. So Connecticut did not like the idea that Vir, uh, Virginia uh, threw up. It, it wasn't. It was the um, idea to improve the government, so I, I'm guessing that's the uh, the proposal to have the meeting to create the uh, Constitution. It, it initially uh, turned off the other states. The eastern states, sir, were, uh, were unwilling to recommend a meeting of a convention. They were well aware of the dangers of revolution and changes. Why was every effort used and such uncommon pains taken to bring it about? This would have been unnecessary had it been approved by the people. Was Pennsylvania disposed for the reception of this project of reformation? Okay, I, I, I think I'm starting to get this. Um, so... So, it definitely sounds like when he's talking about theoretical experiments, he's talking about the creation of a new constitution. The East, he, and he's saying that the, the Eastern, he's asking, how did the Eastern states respond to it? How, what were they saying? What were they saying? Connecticut hated the idea. The Eastern states were unwilling uh, to recommend a meeting for, of a con were unwilling to recommend a meeting of a convention because they did not want it. They did not want this. And they know the risks and dangers that revolution can bring. They know the risks of the, of future rebellion. So why why did so much effort go into creating this convention? And uh, so. So th there's definitely a, it, it, there's definitely a complaint about it saying that the convention was undemocratic, it was not approved by the people, uh, and Pennsylvania faced no charge for this. There was no um, there there was no backlash to it really, but there was a big. It seems to me that this is saying there was such a big issue about having this convention that. Most that at least a number of states, uh, I'm not gonna say most, it was 13, and I, I'm not sure how many the eastern states were. Maybe, maybe it was five, maybe it was three. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, three would be a lot back then, but it, it sounds to me like, um, it, well, I, I guess it's pretty straightforward actually that, uh, he that. He's saying the states weren't interested in this, and yet Pennsylvania forced it through anyways. And I believe that that is the convention when George Washington was named president. Uh, that's what I was saying in uh, under the Shays Rebellion. Um, I actually, uh, that's another thing I I hadn't uh, looked into too much before is exactly when George Washington was first labeled pre uh, named president. <laughs> Oh man, I need to learn a lot more about. It. I I know so much about policy, and uh, 
civics, but I do not know enough about the actual events about the U.S. founding enough. That's one of the reasons why I'm reading this. Um, well, I suppose this is more policy side too, more rhetoric, but eh, is what it is. We'll, we'll figure it out as it goes along. No, sir. She was even unwilling to amend her revenue laws so as to make the five per centum operatum, operat, operative. She was satisfied with things as they were. There was no complaint that ever I heard of from any other part of the Union except Virginia. <laughs> so, he, he's kind of throwing Virginia under, under the bus as just like forcing this stuff to happen. And be essentially being the squeaky wheel. Um, whereas everyone else was kind of chill. This being the case among ourselves, what dangers were there to be apprehended from foreign nations? This is almost like a direct retort to Federalist Paper Number 2. Um, and I just recorded that same shirt. Uh, so I hope you guys read that one because the entire Federalist Paper Number 2 it was supposedly about foreign influence, foreign powers, and yet it makes no mention of any kind of foreign influence. Like, it, it, it's in the title, but it's not really in the document. The document's a lot of flowery words about our founders and how the founders came to the convention and they're so wonderful and we should follow them and think about how ideal our union is and if we don't do the new constitution the union is going to fall apart that's that's what the uh, that's what the foundation was so it's interesting to see how how directly article number two is kind of countering that the the the, the anti-federalist paper is definitely this is this one is a direct counter to federalist number two um at least thus far uh, so very very interesting um this being the case among ourselves with okay foreign nations uh it will be easily shown that dangers from that quarter were absolutely imaginary. Was, n was not France friendly? Unequivocally so. She was devising new regulations of commerce for our advantage. Did she harass us with applications for her money? Is it likely that France will quarrel with us? Is it not reasonable to suppose that she will, will be more desirous than ever to cling after losing the Dutch Republic to her best ally? How are, how are the Dutch? We owe them money, it is true. And are they not willing that we should owe them more? <laughs> Mr. John Adams applied to them for a new loan for the poor, despised Confederation. They readily granted it. The Dutch have a fellow feeling for us. They were in the same situation with ourselves. This is this is actually really funny. So France likes us because France doesn't like Britain, and we we broke off from Britain. We uh, we rebelled against Britain. So France likes us. They they helped fund us throughout the revolution. Uh, we know that. And the Dutch uh, apparently we were very much in debt to the Dutch at this point. And he's just like, so what are the Dutch going to do? They're not going to break us. They'll want more money from us. We'll get more debt. Look, John Adams just applied for a new loan. That's really funny. And again, he he's he's calling out the despised confederation because he's saying, like, you people hate what we are. The, the people at the convention who want to make this new constitution hate the confederation we have. Um... So th that's I see it as that's kind of funny. I think it's a uh, sorry about all all that sliding. Um, yeah, they <laughs> they really are taking shots back and forth. But I I think this is this retort follows um is very logically based. It's not it's not using the flowery emotional arguments that 
Federalist number two use. So, so far, um, I am very much liking this paper better, just to get my biases out of the way so everyone knows it. Um, I believe that the money which the Dutch borrowed of Henry IV is not yet paid. How did they pass Queen Elizabeth's loan? At the very considerable, at a very dis considerable discount, they took advantage of the weakness and necessities of James I, and made their own terms with that contemptible monarch. Loans from nations are not like loans from private men. Nations lend money and grant assistance to one another from views of national interest. France was willing to pluck the fairest feather out of the British crown. This was her object in aiding us. She will not quarrel with us on pecuni pecuniary considerations. Congress considered it in this point of view. For when a, when a proposition was made to make it a debt of private persons, it was rejected without hesitation. That respectable body wisely considered that while we remain their debtors is so cons considerable a degree in so considerable a degree, they would not be inattentive to our interests. So this shows some striking wisdom among our founders, because he's pointing out that we got low. We worked with France because France wanted to hurt Britain, and us leaving Britain helped France. And now France can have us as an ally. That makes us a political tool, a political advantage that the French have. That's that's such that's a very clear and logical uh, rationale, and pointing out our debts to foreign nations, our debts to France, to to the Dutch, maybe mostly the Dutch. I don't know if we actually owed anything to the French. The French may have just been like, "Hey, here, take this." Uh, probably not, but maybe. Um, he, he makes no mention of debts to the to the uh, French, though. Would, but he did the Dutch. So it's it's curious how he mentioned that and it's something I will look into once again. I have a lot of history to learn <laughs> to review. That that is See, I didn't learn any of this from reading the, from so far going from Federalist 1 or 2. I'm I'm on my second anti-federalist paper and already I'm just like, "Oh, I need to look this up. I need to look up I need to look this up." This is this is why I'm enjoying the, the anti-federalist paper. So I want to do these side by side. Um because I I knew the anti-federalist papers had had a very logical flow at least at least uh from the maybe 5 or 10 I had re I had gone through uh in the past few months it, at the very least in passing I haven't really hard read them but yeah so I, the the logic makes sense though because we're in debt to them we need to pay them back they're not going to want to harm us because if things go badly for us, we can't pay off our debt. If things go well for us, we can pay off our debt and we can pay off our interest that we owe them. It makes them more money. That is, that's fairly, uh, that's honestly brilliant and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, they could try to take us over, but honestly, that would just cost them more money and they, they wouldn't financially gain much from it. So uh, it, that's a... It's very interesting to me. Um, anyhow, with respect to Spain, she is friendly in a high degree. I wish to know by whose interposition was the treaty with Morocco. The, the treaty with... By whose interposition was the treaty with Morocco made? Was it not by that of the king of Spain? Several predatory nations disturbed us on going into the Mediterranean. Why is there a comma there? Huh. I'm, I'm wondering if this is talking about us going into the Mediterranean or several uh, or several nations which extend into the Mediterranean, so like Italy, so on and so forth. Uh, probably the latter, I'm guessing. The influence of Charles III at the, bar uh, the Barbary court and 4,000 pounds procured as good as as good a treaty with Morocco as could be expected, but I acknowledge it is not of any consequence since the Algerian Algerines Algerines I can call them Algerines since since the Algerines and the people of Tunis have not entered into sim similar measures. 
I apologize for uh, my current date. I, I've got a lot to, of work to do, so I'm having to force this one out today. Uh, normally, I might have rested more before this. But, uh, yeah, uh, look forward to a lot of content coming up over the next week because I, I, I'm, I'm basically trying to get a week ahead in the next three days. So let me uh, regain my focus here. We have nothing to fear from Spain. And were she hostile, she could never be formidable to this country. Her strength is so scattered that she can that she never can be dangerous to us either in peace or war. As to Portugal, we have a treaty with her, which may be very advantageous, though it be not yet ratified. So we already are forming a treaty. It's it's not fully um, commensurated. They haven't ratified it yet. They haven't uh, settled it in stone. But the treaties being the treaties developed, um, it's just the specifics that are being figured out. Uh, Spain, Spain is a, a very powerful empire at this time, but it's spread out. It's spread thin. Uh, they they, they kind of just went through their outbursts. They've got their uh, conquistadors going out, conquering South America and whatnot, uh, Mexico and below as well as all those islands, but Spain itself, at least by claims here, not a threat. That That's the message they're getting across. We don't have foreign threats. It, at, at least the colonies don't at this time. Or, sorry, the Union doesn't at this time. I'm not sure if I should call it the United States or the Union, because uh, we're technically a different country at this point with at the point that we uh, enact the Constitution. Are we not? I, I would take us as being a new a new uh, country at that point. So I find it very interesting that um, that I'm, I'm trying to talk about the part of the country from when we were under the Articles of Confederation because it's there is that question of it, if it's even the same country, or um, how to define what we are. Anyhow, um, moving along. It's a little late. I'm a little all over the place. I'm sorry. Uh, the domestic debt is diminished by considerable sales of Western lands to, Col to Cutler, uh, Surgent and Company, to Sims, and to Royal Flint and Company. The Board of Treasury is authorized to sell in Europe or anywhere else the residue of those lands. So, so he's essentially, it sounds like, he, so he's proposing to sell off uh, the West, the, uh, the West of the U.S. to uh, Europe and other lands in order to pay off our debts. Curious curious i don't it, and it sounds almost like we may have to pay off to pay down some of our debts hmm is that why we had to go through the louisiana purchase i guess so that's that's interesting an act of congress has passed to adjust the public debts between the individual states and the united states okay so i can't just call it the united states okay cool Just the public debts, so they 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 kind of split the debts up fairly, and also nationally there is a there is kind of a national level of it too, so makes sense. Uh, kind of kind of like, hey, we each take a part in our individual in what individually we had to cover, but also we're gonna have the whole thing uh, cover a lot of. We're gonna we're gonna have our compiled efforts cover some stuff, because. Uh, which which makes sense because the nation may not grow in unison. There may be areas that grow wealthy faster or slower. Yada yada. An act of Congress is passed to adjust the public debts between individual states in the United States. Was our trade in a despicable situation? 
I shall say nothing of what did not come under my own observations. When I was in Congress, 16 vessels ha had had sea letters in the East India trade, and 200 vessels entered and cleared out in the French West, in the French West India Islands in one year. I must confess that public credit has suffered and that our public creditors have been ill-used. Um, I'm going to keep going with this before I talk about all this. This was owing to a fault at the headquarters to Congress themselves in not selling the Western lands at an earlier period. If requisitions had not been com complied with, it must be owing to Congress, who might have put the unpopular debts on the back lands. Constitution, co commutation is abhorrent to New England ideas. Hey, <laughs> he said the name of my channel. I'm gl I'm glad that my channel is named after something important to you. Uh, though I I believe I use commutation differently than it is than it is used in this context. I I, I use commutation essentially as a word in place of ideas. <laughs> Uh, so commutation construct, building ideas. That's literally what, how I'm using the name. That is my literal definition. <laughs> Build construct is construct. Uh, commutation is ideas. <laughs> For anyone, uh, wondering why commutation is abhorrent to New England ideas, it's different. Speculation is abhorrent to the Eastern states. Those inconveniences, incon, yeah, that's inconvenience. Oh yeah, it is an IE. Interesting. So, those inconveniences have resulted from the bad policy of Congress. There are certain modes of governing the people which will succeed. Now, hold on. Before I go forward with this, let's actually go back and talk about this whole trade thing. So... I don't understand the context of the uh, of the despicable the asking of the despicable situation of our trade at the time because I, I when he says entered and cleared out and had sea had sea letters in the East India trade done with the did the French uh, West India Islands. I'm not sure if he's saying we made money or if we lost money in this. But considering he makes a confession that public credit has suffered after this, I'm guessing he says that these things were good. These things were us handling trade well. Um, so so he, admits, he, he describes where we did trade well, and then he goes into uh essentially where congress has failed with our trade and whatnot and remember and under the articles of confederation we did not have a president it was all our government was all congress and courts so um at least that's what i believe that's the case i mean george washington is our first president and he, uh and i believe he was nominated at the uh he was nominated at the at the convention, so I believe this convention, not a convention after. Uh, too many, too many convent, too many uh, specific details in history. I need to go back and review. I must confess, public. Okay, yeah. So Congress messed up a lot of our trades by waiting to sell the Western lands. Um, the, the price ended up in, fl uh, should I say inflating or de the price inflated or deflated? I, I suppose I should say the price deflated, though that's kind of weird because def deflation is when your v currency becomes stronger. Uh, but it's also, you buy more for less. So I, I'm guessing this is saying that, Hey, once we were in debt and we really needed to pay it down. We, by selling the lands late, we got less money for them because because other countries knew we were desperate at that point, and that kind of that kind of screwed us up. 
Um, <laughs> the commutation thing is kind of funny for, to me still just because of my name. There are certain modes of governing the people which will succeed. There are others which will not. The idea of consolidation is abhorrent to the people of this country. So, essentially, this is a states' rights versus federal rights here because the Constitution is aimed at greatly increasing federal power. Um, since, since it's great, designed to greatly increase federal power, he's saying we're consolidating all of our decisions and all of our power and all of our success to the federal government. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> this this is horrible. We're, we're losing the the people are losing control by doing this. Uh, it, it's like it, it's it's against the principles of what the of the liberty our country was founded on. Th that that's why it's abhorrent because it just it's against the principles. How were the sentiments of the people before the meeting of the convention at Philadelphia? They had only one object in view. Their ideas reached no farther than to give the general government the five per centum impost and the regulation of trade. So they they get the tariff. They get the 5% the, the tariff. Um, actually, I think per centum is different from percent. I, I need to verify that. There's so much I need to verify. Um, just because the language is so differently used, people don't use percentum anymore. Um, and a regulation of trade. When it was agitated in Congress, in a committee of the whole, this was all that was asked or was deemed necessary. Since that period, their views have ex have extended much farther. Horrors have been greatly magnified since the rising of the convention. So initially, people were just like, hey, uh, yeah, we can pay a 5% tariff and you guys can regulate our trade. That's our international trade or actually maybe interstate trade, too. So you can regulate trade and we'll pay a 5% tax and you'll protect us, yada, yada, you know, just the basic stuff. And now they're saying, we want more. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's kind of killer right now. Yeah, so the government was asking for more power, and he's just like, and, and now people have all these different ideas that they need to talk about. Uh, <laughs> horrors have been greatly magnified. That it, it's really expressing just how people are like, oh my god, what if the government starts doing this? What if the government starts doing this? People are now worried about what the government's going to do because they've gone so because they're already looking so far beyond what they were initially designed for initially uh, promised we are now told by the honorable gentleman that we shall have wars and rumors of wars that every calamity is to attend us and that we shall be ruined and disunited forever unless we adopt this constitution that literally happened in federalist too <laughs> That was literally what Federalist 2 was all about. So this, I tell you, this, this is a perfect, uh, this is a, really a perfect retort to Federalist number two. Um, and I find it very funny that uh, there's like, yeah, they're essentially calling out the Federalists as fear mongering. <laughs> They're explicitly calling out the Federalists as fear-mongering. <laughs> Sorry, had to correct that. Um, and about war calamity and the Union would clearly fall apart. By what means? So that's pretty funny. Um, Pennsylvania and Maryland are to fall upon us from the north. Like the Goths and Vandals of old, the Algerians, whose flat-sided vessels never came farther than M Madeira, are to fill the Chesapeake with mighty fleets and to attack us on our fronts. The 
Indians are to invade us with numerous armies on our rear in order to convert our cleared lands into hunting grounds and the Carolinians from the south, mounted on alligators, I presume. <laughs> I love, I love that. The humor and sarcasm that is brought forth in this paper is masterful. I, I, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of vagities and a lot of stuff that needs explicit context and thought to kind of get through. But, w but when he's digging, but digging in the heels here, the author is just laying it so flat he's like oh yeah we're, we're gonna be attacked by our fellow states we're gonna be attacked from the from the indians who we chase off we're gonna be at north states to the north states to the south indians to the west everyone's gonna attack us and, and of course the carolinians uh because, because they come from swamps yeah they're gonna attack us mounted on alligators <laughs> like it, it, just to show how ridiculous the idea is it's that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Totally masterful. Uh, masterful sarcasm. <laughs> Are to come and destroy our cornfields and eat up our little children. I'm presuming that's the alligators again. <laughs> These, sir, are the mighty dangers which await us if we reject dangers <laughs> which are merely imaginary. <laughs> oh... And ludicrous in the extreme. Yes. <laughs> yes, he is he has framed them masterfully as being quite ludicrous. Are we to be destroyed by Maryland and Pennsylvania? What will democratic states make war for? And how long since have they imbibed a hostile spirit? So for for what reason will a democratic state where the people are all just like, eh, we, we want to just take care of ourselves. Why, why are they going to go to war? Why is a surplus of people going to say, yeah, we should attack those people and it, our neighbors who we are in a union with? It's like it, there's no point to it. it. It's unrealistic that it would happen. Uh, or... May not necessarily totally unrealistic, but it's incredibly unlikely um, until some prince gets shot in the head. But again, these are democratic states. They're they're not. They don't. That I think that's the point of him bringing up that it's democratic states. You're not going to have a situation like with like what started World War One, where princes like prince gets shot in the head and then war breaks out. So, um, so there there is no. There is no leader with jealousies or uh, or other reasons to um, to bring war because the general people aren't going to have those issues. Like maybe some people will have issues with other people, but in general, they're not going to aggregately have have that issue. That that seems to be my understanding of that. But the generality. The generality are to attack us. Will they attack us after violating their faith in the first union? See, th that's what he's pointing out. He's just like, they have no faith in the first... Well, there's a couple ways you could say this. So, violating faith in the first union. So, he's saying that these people are going to break the f union, The they're going to break the Articles of Confederation and then attack us. Or he's saying that the people uh in the con the people who go through the process of making the um or he it sounds like it might be sarcastic regarding to uh well now, now we have this constitution where you're you're kind of violating the faith, faith of the first uni union by creating a second one so are you going to attack us if we disagree? That so that might be a bit of a double entendre. Um, that, so that's that's a that's actually a really good line if if that's the case. Um, but that so that's just 
something like a pronoun. Uh, will they not violate their faith if they did not take us into their confederacy? Will they? Uh, too many knots. Will they not violate their faith if they do not take us into their confederacy? So if we're not in the confederacy. I hate when they use double knots, but uh, will they not violate our faith that they do not take us into their confederacy? Have they not agreed by the old confederation that the union shall be perpetual and that no alteration should take place without consent, without the consent of Congress and the confirmation of the legislatures of every state? So. Okay. It I'm taking that as will they not violate their faith if we don't join the un the new union? Hmm. Okay, so I th I think this is actually basically saying will, will will they not is there no chance of a success if if they're willing to break up the first union why would they not break up the second? Um, uh, sorry, I, I was initially going about thinking about that in the wrong direction. I think, um, yeah, have they not agreed by the old confederation that the union shall be perpetual? So everyone's already agreed that the union will be perpetual. Uh, no alteration will happen without Congress. So no one can join or leave without Congress's approval and the confirmation of every state's le legislature. I cannot think that there is such depravity in mankind as that. After violating public faith so flagrantly, they should make war upon us also for not following their example. That's funny. It's like, so they are so upset that we aren't breaking up the union that they're gonna they're gonna enact war upon us. <laughs> that's because we didn't want to break up the union. That that's kind of again. I I love the sarcasm. It's a little hard to read because it's so because of the changing times. But it is really funny. It's it's really good when you when you get it. The large states have divided the backlands among themselves and have given as much as they thought proper to the generality. For the fear of disunion, we are told that we ought to take measures which we otherwise should not. Disunion is impossible. The eastern states hold the fisheries, which are, which, which are their cornfields by a hair. They have a dispute with the British government about their limits at this moment. Is not a general and strong government necessary for their interest? If ever nations had induced to peace, the eastern states now have. New York and Pennsylvania anxiously look forward to the, to the fur trade. How can they obtain it but by union? Can a western post be got or attained without union how are the little states inclined so okay so this is a rebuttal to the to uh the federalists saying that the union will fall apart without taking up the new constitution because every state has a moneyed interest in remaining unionized every state by every trade um like the so the eastern states with their fisheries have an issue with the British limiting their movement. We need a strong central – we need a central government in order to to basically get, enable our fisheries to be able to do what they need to do, to be able to get through those limits. The, we need to have the trade rights for New York and Pennsylvania for the fur trade. Um, how else – without the union, how will they get it? 
individually, but will it be in their favor if they do that? Probably not. Can a Western post be got or retained without union? How are the little states inclined? They are not likely to disunite. Their weakness will prevent them from quarreling. So, yeah, there, there are so many little states in the U.S. We had Connecticut at this point. It's tiny. There's Rhode Island. Like, uh, we, we have some really tiny states. They're not going to be able to fight wars. They're not going to be able to fight off giants. They're not going to be... Like, David and Goliath is not a story about a small person beating down a giant. David and Goliath is about... David and Goliath is about a well-armed child or not child, but a well-armed uh, shepherd defeating an armed soldier. So it, it's not actual. They weren't fighting on the same uh, playing field. The uh, So what you have to realize is that the small generally doesn't actually conquer the big. The, ch the child, the, the small country, whatever it is, if you are at a disadvantage, you are at a disadvantage. And being of such a small size is a massive disadvantage without some other kind of overcoming uh, situation. In, in, this, in the case of David and Goliath, Goliath had all this armor. He was a big hulking guy uh, who could apparently barely see. Um, but and then Goliath... Well, he is a he was a slinger. So for him, he puts rocks inside of a inside of like uh what's it called? Not a sheath, a uh a sling basically and they spin it around as fast as they can. It, it it's a, and it goes incredibly fast. It basically fires like a bullet. It's essentially, it's essentially using a gun. It's ba it's essentially using a gun from a distance to take out a uh, to take out uh, some like dude in armor who's like meters away. The, the guy in armor never had it. It's the actual one who never had the chance. Goliath was the weak one in this situation because. Uh, he he was showing up ready to fight a guy hand to hand combat, and sure he could have crushed with that. He can't deal with a sniper. <laughs> but likewise, uh, small states like if, if they don't if they don't have a secret weapon, like they don't have the sniper, they're they're not the sniper fighting against. Uh, they aren't gonna in a war. They wouldn't be the sniper fighting against the swordsmen. They're going to be basically soldier, regular soldier versus regular soldier. Gunnery versus gunnery. Who, who will win in that situation? Probably the small one. Or probably the big one. Sorry. <laughs> I went on all that rant and then I ended up getting it wrong. <laughs> I, end up, I, I end up flubbing it. Damn it. Pulled a, pulled a Joe Biden. <laughs> it's the thing, man. <laughs> all right. Anyhow, uh, so that's a really good point. I, I just want to go into my David and Goliath thing because I, I know some people be like, ah, the small country can fight. And just like, no, no, not really. There, there's other advantages. I mean, th even with the U.S.'s Revolutionary War, we basically won just by outlasting the British and outcosting them because it cost them a lot of money to send ships overseas and fight these wars and we were like yeah we're here we're being boosted by other states and also we lost most battles <laughs> so it's it's kind of funny it's kind of funny it's weird that we won that but it worked it worked out we we just had the right advantage you got to have an advantage that's all so the the small states, their weakness will prevent them from quarreling. Yes, <laughs> little men are sa seldom fond of quarreling among giants. <laughs> so again, David and Goliath is not that. That th that I wanted to bring that up because I know there are people who would think David and Goliath when they read the Little Men 
uh, fighting against giants. It's a very, it, it's actually a very different story than what you think. Is there not a strong inducement to union while the British are on one side and the Spaniards are on the others? Thank heaven we have a Carthage of our own eye, of our own eye. Hmm. That's so weird. Cut off, but okay. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe there were no good records of the end of that sentence. Maybe you just said, I suppose. I don't know. I suppose he said, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, so he's just, so it's kind of funny how he said that the Spaniards aren't a threat. But now it's just like, hey, we're sandwiched between the British and the Spaniards. If we don't have a union, we're going to get crushed by them. Which, yes. Definitely, yes. The British will come right back and be like, what is this? You've got a thousand guys. We're crushing you. <laughs> and then it would just go one state at a time. The Spaniards, same thing. Like, as a union, we're a threat to the Spaniards. They're not going to bother us, but individually, they'll just come and crush. One by one. For whatever they can get. But what would I do on the present occasion to remedy the existing defects of the present confederation? There are two opinions prevailing the world, prevailing in the world. The one, that mankind can only be governed by force. The other, that they are capable of freedom and a good and a good government. Under, under a supposition that mankind can govern themselves, I would recommend that the present confederation should be amended, give Congress the regulation of commerce, infuse new strength and spirit into the state governments, for when the component parts are strong, it will give energy to the government, although it, it be otherwise weak. This is... Again, there's there's another ellipses here, and I'm wondering if we're missing some context. I will, I will look for this in the book to see if I can uh, verify that the, there's nothing after these ellipses. But very, uh, it's a no-win situation because the book doesn't actually order the anti-federalist papers, so it, I can't. So it's hard to just go back and verify that I'm always on the right one. Um, I mean, I could do that, but it'd be... Eh, fi finding them in that book is not easy because they're not in order at all. It, it, it's a total mess. But... Yeah, I... This, this is a very libertarian look at government. Because it's saying the federal government will remain weak. It, it's not going to have a high strength to it. It'll regulate commerce. But for the most part, if we give the states more power, more strength, if they're able to do more on their own, then the federal government will be fine because the states are are all a part of it. The The parts make the whole. Apportion the public debts in such a manner as to throw the unpopular ones on the backlands. Call only for requisition for the foreign interests and aid them by loans. For the foreign interests and aid them by loans. Hmm. So only take in money when you have when we have foreign interests uh, in mind and pay. And don't put the full debt on our people. Use loans to try to balance, to try to um, keep from overburdening our people. Yeah, I, I can see that working. That way the people can continue to succeed. And, and as the people succeed, they'll be able to pay off the loans easier. So I, I understand it. Keep on so till the American character be marked with some certain features. We are yet too young to know what we are fit for. The continual migration of people from Europe and the settlement of new countries on our western frontiers are strong arguments against making new experiments now in government. When these things are removed, we can with greater prospect of success devise changes. We ought to consider, as Montesquieu says, whether the construction of the government be suitable to the genius 
to the genius and disposition of the people, as well as a variety of other circumstances. All right, that is it. So let's uh, just look at this last paragraph, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Um, so we already covered about the loans, but th this is a pretty good point. The country is so young. At, at this point, the art how many years have we been out of the uh, the Revolutionary War at this point? Not very many. This is so short after the U.S. became a country became a country of its own. This is so short after the Articles of Confederation went into power that they're already saying scrap it all, scrap it all, and make something new, bigger, stronger. Um, and from a federal from a federalist perspective, better. But and re remember, in Federalist Number Two, they said you're going to have to give up your rights. They said to the people, in order to give the government the power it needs, you must give up your rights. Why? Why is that? According to this paper, it's like, hey, the government will regulate international trade and possibly internal trade to some extent. It does say it does just say regulate trade. Um, but the government will regulate trade uh, because that's a necessity. And and the states will have pow will have high power to be able to you know take care of what they need to for themselves for their personal needs. Uh, the federal government can provide protection. It can provide it can provide um, a means to gain trade for uh, multiple states. That way, we don't the states don't have to all compete for the same trading opportunities and. They can all have access for better and cheaper prices, stuff like that. Uh, there, there, there's a financial benefit here, and it's not really costing any rights beyond the five percent them. It's not really costing too many rights. I mean, there will be some rights that are going to be uh, harsh, but in general, it it wanted to be designed to be fairly easy on the people. At least at the federal level. At least at the federal level. Again, it gives a lot of power to the states. The states could do what they want, and that's how you got Shays Rebellion. Because the state was draining their farmers dry. After the people hadn't been treated too well after the Revolutionary War, too. So, there is a lot to this. I really like this argument. Um, I... Just just between the the last uh, Federalist paper I read and this Anti-Federalist paper, I, I definitely would have been siding with the Anti-Federalists at the time. I'm curious what you all are thinking. Would you have would you have been swayed by this, or did you did you prefer the more flowery language of Federalist Number Two? Did did you did you like the emotional and the moral um, displays? that were delivered there or does this more hard structured logic but maybe not necessarily uh, clear enough writing i would say like i i, I never questioned uh, aside from when i didn't know a word or two i never really questioned what the federalist number two was saying in this one i'm just like you're not providing me the full context you're you're saying stuff in terms that people of your time will, may uh, may understand but not necessarily that will be broadly understood uh things out won't be lasting so it, it this seems like it was very much written for people in the know and and he says sir a lot so i am i am assuming that this letter was designed to be written to uh essentially to the president because or may not to the president but to congress uh, and, and maybe it was written to the people, but it, it just seems to me that there is a very direct person this was written to. Maybe it was written to the governor. But, uh, yeah, this has been Anti-Federalist Paper number two. We have been told of phantoms, and it is, it, it's an interesting paper. It does a great job of establishing 
that the phantom of war between the states is is unrealistic. War with other countries, not that realistic, as long as we remain unionized. And the and the thought that we would de-unionize just because we don't take on a new constitution makes no sense because the states have economic and security reasons to maintain their um their the union as it is so i really like this paper i i i think it's very interesting i hope you guys like it too please leave comments below uh again if you want to provide more details uh, either about like shay's rebellion or any of that stuff we covered um that really uh could help clarify some of the details details here that i had mentioned uh please go ahead and do that uh i really look forward to reading what you guys have to say on this i think it's i think it's a very i, th I think it's a cool topic i think this is a really cool topic uh and I'm, I'm loving getting the chance to go through these with you guys i know if i was doing this on my own because i actually read like this <laughs> this is how i actually read pretty much everything which is why i'm a very slow reader uh it would just take me forever to get through all this so being able to make it provide it as content for you guys enables me to actually get through these myself as well because otherwise i I just don't think I would have uh, the time because I would always have to be researching for whatever else I'm doing for you guys. So I'm happy to have this for you. I hope you're happy to have it. And I really look forward to next time. Uh, it's been a blast. Uh, so yeah, this, is, this, <laughs> this has been commutation readings anti-federalist paper number two remember like like and subscribe if you're on bit or youtube uh give it the thumbs down if you're feeling that way i'm fine with it i i know i'm not in my best form right now um i'm really dehydrated i i might have a bit of a cough so i'm stuttering a bit through things but yeah uh <laughs> It's been good. It's been real. I'll talk to you guys later, all right? See ya.